sorry. I'm really sorry. I said get out. And Nathan, be under no illusion. This isn't about you being illegitimate. It's about you being a bastard. EastEnders, watched by a quarter of the population every day. And we see Shakespeare's legacy at work. This section is inspired by his great tragedy, King Lear. No writer before or since has caught us so completely as William Shakespeare. He's taken our passions and our personalities, our faults and our foibles, and celebrated them with such brilliance. The language is littered with phrases and words that he invented and has made English the envy of the world. Wherever you find English, you find Shakespeare. That's why I believe he is the greatest Briton that ever lived. And yet the life of this man who hailed from Stratford-on-Avon 400 years ago remains an almost complete mystery. Shakespeare wrote for an audience that experienced his plays live. Many couldn't read and write, but they could see and hear. His plays were based on stories they knew well and a language and a rhythm they found familiar. The genius of Shakespeare is that the same rhythm connects with us today. But who is William Shakespeare? He is possibly the most famous person in the English-speaking world. He symbolizes fame. He's famous for being famous. He is also the most loathed writer, seen by many as irrelevant and old-fashioned, an embarrassing symbol of ye old England, and seen by most schoolchildren as just plain complicated. This unfortunate reputation is in part due to the Shakespeare industry. This is Shakespeare's birthplace. So it's not easy to find the immediate living Shakespeare. One of the things that gets in the way is some notion that Shakespeare is great and a great man has to have an easy to understand, often rather modest past. But in fact, Shakespeare's imagination has little to do with this sanitized museum world. If we're to begin in the beginning, we must begin here. As far as we know, William Shakespeare was born on St. George's Day, the 23rd of April, 1564. He came into a world where life was mostly nasty, brutish, and short. His father was a glove maker and also a tanner and a butcher. Within three months of his birth, Stratford was hit by plague, as it frequently was, and one in seven of the town's inhabitants was killed. His two older siblings had both died in infancy. When Shakespeare later wrote his plays, he was to show a gruesomely precise knowledge of butchery. Perhaps this is why so many dripped with blood and conjured the stench of death. Now could I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. The 16th century was a dangerous place. Catholics and Protestants fought for religious supremacy. In England, the Protestants were winning, but that brought with it the constant threat of war or invasion from Catholic Europe. 
peacetime was just as uncertain. The plague, a lethal virus spread by a mere sneeze, kept life expectancy to 38 years. As William Shakespeare began his life, Elizabeth I was beginning her reign. She brought stability and encouraged drama and music. But even with the Virgin Queen, England was still fragile, and everything was up for grabs. Including the very language. Only a century earlier, English was seen as a vulgar peasant language, incapable of expressing refined thought. And it was spoken in a bewildering range of dialects. The upper classes spoke French and Latin. And the Canterbury Tales, written by Chaucer, was a poetic fusion of all these sounds. I've always thought that the Middle English in which Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is written is a strange hybrid between French and German. The beginning of it is, Men in April, when the sure assault, the drought of March had pierced it to the road, and bathed every vein in such a cure of which virtue engendered is the floor. When Zephyrus eke with his sweet breath, inspired hath in every hoth and heath tender cross, and a younger son hath in the land of his uncle. But never mind that this language sounded a bit like French. When Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales, it was the new, exciting English he used, rather than one of the classical languages. And even more crucially, the work of Chaucer and others was now captured and reproduced by a new invention, the printing press, first introduced into England in 1476 by William Caxton. Great moments in the history of technology are so often the shaping moments for great talents. The Beatles can thank the invention of vinyl. Bill Gates can thank the development of the first user-friendly computer software. Young William Shakespeare was given English. He took it, added new words of his own, and ran with it. Gossip, elbow, fixture, puking, obscene, generous, frugal, champion. Today, about a third of the world's population can read Shakespeare in their own languages. If they read him in the original English, they would find that about 1,700 words are his invention or are used by him in a new way. Courtship, assassination, deafening, circumstantial, blanket, negotiate. He turned nouns into verbs, verbs into nouns. And in all, his plays use a vocabulary of about 30,000 words, many more than the average educated person will use in a lifetime. Virgil, Thunderbirds. When William Shakespeare entered the Free Grammar School in Stratford, probably aged five, he was one of only the second generation of pupils ever to have learned grammar. Estes. The English language was as new and full of possibilities then as the internet is now. Semper spectatus. It offered a whole new medium by which to tell stories and describe feelings. The grammar schools were educational hothouses. The pupils worked for 12 hours a day, six days a week, 52 weeks of the year. They were force-fed English, Latin, Greek, and history. Maybe this is where Shakespeare's creativity was born and took form. Maybe. Because the truth is, his early life is like a torn map where we can see where he started but not one tiny trace of his actual journey has been recorded. Right, folks, the club down the trousers now, folks, please. But one worry. thing we do know is that William's father was mayor of Stratford, and one of his duties would have been to bring traveling players to the town. And it's fair to assume that young William would have enjoyed a ringside seat. Plays at this time were fluid things, adapted and improvised as they went along. Build a crowd now. <laughs> Perhaps this was where Shakespeare got his inspiration to write and perform. We know that one of the most famous troops in the country, the Queen's Men, visited Stratford at this time. They had just lost one of their actors, 
Perhaps teenage William stepped into his shoes. Perhaps, who knows. But somewhere along the line, he did develop skills as an actor. The details of Shakespeare's childhood are pretty sketchy, but one can imagine his life with friends and family. However, the next eight years, the period between 15 and 23, remain a complete mystery. And these are sometimes called the lost years. All that's known is that sometime in his early 20s, Shakespeare left Stratford and made the two-day journey to London to become an actor and a playwright. Why then the world's mine oyster, which I with sword will open. We don't know what made him leave. By that time, he had a wife and three children. Family life had begun somewhat accidentally when he got a farmer's daughter, Anne Hathaway, pregnant. She was 26, he was 18. The year was 1582. Marriage happened swiftly. In 1585, Anne had twins. Perhaps William left for London to earn more money for his family. Or perhaps he just ran away. All sorts of ideas have been put forward for what Shakespeare might have been up to in the lost years between 1585 and his documented presence as an established playwright in London in 1592. So, why all the conjecture? Well, because this young man from Stratford seems to have been able to write plays, drawing on images from all over the world, and people and ideas and landscapes. So surely people said that he must have traveled to have such knowledge. He must have been a pirate or a fugitive or a sailor of some kind. It seems to Shakespeare, a foreign country was a place of the imagination. True, I talk of dreams, which are the children of an idle brain, begot of nothing but vain fantasy, which is of thin of substance as the air. It's often been said, for example, that Shakespeare must have spent time in Italy because so many of his plays, like Romeo and Juliet and The Taming of the Shrew, are set there. However, he makes a port of landlocked Milan in The Tempest, and he manages to go through the whole of The Merchant of Venice without mentioning that that city was built on water. Shakespeare was transported only by his imagination, and it's his imagination that's transported us ever since. This is why his plays can be reset in any time and any place, because what we recognize in them isn't the dates and the towns, it's the emotions and the experiences. Emotions and experiences and personalities, familiar to everyone, everywhere, at any time. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. <laughs> and all the clouds that flowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. God bless the cross, lady, streets, wall, the wall. We go, ooh, ooh, ooh. Come on, y'all. We got black like a flint fire. By the early 1590s, he'd arrived. He was in London. He was acting. He had written about half a dozen plays, including Richard III, Henry VI, Titus Andronicus, and The Two Gentlemen of Verona. The public loved him. His plays were a sellout. If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it. This is what theatre was like in Shakespeare's time. Like a modern pop concert. Raucous, lively, excited. It's so ironic that some people might feel excluded from Shakespeare's plays, as if somehow they're slightly highbrow or alienating. The truth is that his popularity was precisely because he was able to talk to many different types of people. And his wit was a mixture of sophistication and vulgarity. He didn't even go to university, unlike so many of his fellow playwrights. In 1592, Robert Greene bemoaned the arrival on the London scene 
of an upstart crow called William Shakespeare, a mere actor who had the gall to presume he could write. He cast the playwright as a charlatan who stole others' work. Green was motivated by his envy of Shakespeare's success. But there was a grain of truth in his words. Shakespeare might not have been the great writer he became if it wasn't for his talented contemporary, Christopher Marlowe. Born in the same year as Shakespeare and educated at Cambridge, Marlowe had fantastic early success with Dr. Faustus and Tamblyn. Tragically, however, he was killed in a pub brawl. People thought he was a spy. At the peak of his career, age 29, here in Deptford in 1593. He was a big spur to Shakespeare and seems to have been the only person at all in the same league. However, Shakespeare did have one particular quality that gave him a lead over Marlowe, which was that Shakespeare was an actor and so was able to write always from the point of view of the character that was speaking, allowing the characters to change, stay alive and unfold before one's very eyes. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Quiet for rehearsal. Stand by. Nice and quiet. Action. Got. Like soap writers today, Shakespeare realized that there are only a few good stories. The trick is how you tell them. Shakespeare rarely invented an original plot, but it was the very familiarity of his work that added to its strength. One more. One of his most trusted sources was Holinshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland and Ireland, published in 1587 that Shakespeare rigidly stuck to the historical facts. Instead, he reinvented the people and events to suit his story. His play, King Lear, was taken from the anonymous true chronicle history of King Lear, a drama steeped in religion. Shakespeare removed nearly all its Christian references and its happy ending and turned it into a dark, painful tragedy of age, of fathers and their children. Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word, legitimate. Be under no illusion. This isn't about you being illegitimate. It's about you being a bastard. I grow. I prosper. Now, gods, stand up for bastard. Just as Shakespeare borrowed from well-known stories, so today soap operas borrow from him to rework familiar plots for a modern audience. East Enders writers sometimes use the titles of Shakespeare's plays to describe the themes in their own scripts. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge, break to new mutiny where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Somehow there's a whole world... Not only did Shakespeare use familiar plots, but he also used familiar language, much more familiar than we might think. I mean, I think Shakespeare always has to be very quick. When you read Shakespeare now, it may look complicated, and even actors from the Royal Shakespeare Company get intimidated by it. But if you just concentrate on the rhythm of the language, it all becomes much clearer. And that's what voice coach Cicely Berry is showing these actors. Both alike in dignity. dignity. In fair Verona, where we lay fair. our scene. Our scene. From ancient grudge. Grudge to new Great. mutiny. Mutiny. Where civil blood, blood makes civil hands unclean. unclean. Right, let's all do it together. Okay, let's all read it together. Okay, go. But in two households, both, both alike, alike in dignity. dignity. In, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Language in Shakespeare is rough often, which is why he talks to us all. It's not po just polite, it's not just, oh, this is good literature, is yeah. it? It's so regular, you, there is a, a, a chance that you could start speaking poetry, but isn't there? I'm so afraid, that, yes, and I'm afraid that happens an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's in the rhythm that we understand so much. And although that was an Elizabethan language, in a sense, mm. if you see what I mean, but there is something in that rhythm which still exists for us. And mm. it, that rhythm moves us upward and upward and always as cold as any stone. You know, mm. it's in the mm. absolute rhythm of it that we... And that is what is fascinating, that this rhythm has stayed with us. Arsenal are going to win the Premiership this year right, again. I, I don't like to say this, but, you know... I think it's going to be a double-double. I think Arsenal are going to do it again. I think we might have the Trevor. What people seem to love about Shakespeare was the range and sensuality of his imagination and the rhythm of the language. That's very clear, the UN were behind it, then, and you had all the other countries. He took the natural rhythm of English, of phrases with a rhythm like, I wonder would you like a cup of tea, and turned them into poetry. But in terms of police, fire and ambulance, they all got the same job. Shakespeare brilliantly captured the speech that people used in daily life. He took it and harnessed it into a rhythm that later became known as iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter. It's a horrible name for a beautiful thing. It's just a fancy term to describe the titum 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 rhythm that's the sound of our heart beating. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Shakespeare played with the rhythm we're most familiar with, the rhythm of our own feet and our heartbeat, to generate emotion and excitement. Titum, 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 titum. And when he wanted the audience to feel ill at ease, as in Macbeth, he just reversed the rhythm. Tum ti, tum ti, tum ti, tum ti. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurry burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That would be air, the set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. When the plague struck in 1592, 70% of those who fell ill died, and they were dying at the rate of a thousand a week. In a bid to stop the disease spreading, public buildings were shut down, including the theatres. With the theatres closed and London in the grip of plague, most actors and sensible playwrights left the city for safety. But not Shakespeare. He stayed and instead of writing plays, he wrote sonnets. Edith Sitwell once said that poetry is the articulated scream, and certainly the sonnets are a fantastic example of that. Written in a tight 14-line structure, they carry in them a sort of emotional bombshell, explosive language to do with love, death, fear, loss, and jealousy. So from plague-ridden London, Shakespeare produced some of the most beautiful poetry ever written. Is it thy will, thy image should keep open my heavy eyelids to the weary night? Dost thou desire my slumber should be broken while shadows like to thee do mock my sight? Is it thy spirit that thou sends from thee so far from home into my deeds to pry, to find out shames and idle hours in me, the scope and tenor of thy jealousy? Oh, no. Thy love, though much, is not so great. It is my love that keeps my eye awake, mine own true love that doth my rest defeat to play the watchman ever for thy sake. For thee watch I, whilst thou dost wake elsewhere from me far off, with others all too near. The power of these sonnets makes it hard for people who read them not to feel they must have come from Shakespeare's own personal experience. He wrote so many characters in these poems. They're like mini plays in which he plays himself. They're very passionate and direct. Two households. 
both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. No wonder love is that which Shakespeare is most well known for. Romeo and Juliet has become synonymous with love itself. It's taught us how to love. What Shakespeare's onto is that love is inexplicable. It has no rules. It's mind-blowingly, terrifyingly powerful. In the play, Romeo starts off in love with a young woman called Rosaline, and he's dying of love for her until he goes to a party. And at the party, he sees another girl called Juliet. Shakespeare recognized that love could tear us apart. It can consume us. And it is intriguing that although we know little about Shakespeare's own love life, here was a man who seemed obsessed with love, and indeed with our obsession with it. By the end of the 16th century, London was the theater capital of the world. Actors had been disreputable men of no fixed abode, but now they were creeping towards the establishment. Permanent theaters, professional acting companies, licensed plays, a new world with money to be made from writing. Shakespeare was the first playwright to become rich by his quill. One of the first permanent theaters had been erected by the theatrical impresario James Burbage just a few years before Shakespeare's arrival in London. In 1594, Burbage's son and a dozen other actors, including Shakespeare, formed a theater company called the Lord Chamberlain's Men. They all shared the profits, enabling Shakespeare to become a professional writer and freeing him from the dependence on patronage that other writers of the age relied on. With wealth came the freedom to write what he wanted. It was a freedom that made him playful. He wrote several comedies, such as A Midsummer Night's Dream, What You Do About Nothing, and As You Like It. Shakespeare used the irony of comedy to create worlds in which a fool could speak with the wisdom of a king, and a king could experience the raw life of a pauper. Turning the world upside down was something he always loved to do, even in his history plays. It was a way of making everyone equal and giving everyone a voice. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live onto the world. And for because the world is populous and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. These are the fateful lines of Richard II shortly before he dies, having received the wisdom of being stripped of his kingship and now a prisoner, alone, shunned by society. One day, the Lord will get his way. And I will be there to help judge this man. In this prison in Nottinghamshire, Modern-day prisoners are discovering that they can grasp the language of Shakespeare's 16th century verse and use it to express themselves in verse of their own. Some say thy fault is youth, some wantonness. I am merely man, son of daughter. Life like water, always moving. Stagnant still, as people be. Free or not so free. Excellent, excellent. excellent. They invent, excellent. add words of their own to Shakespeare and they discover that this language, when they own it, empowers them and frees them, perhaps. Blessed by the Most High, creator of me, even during my lowest of times, I'm rich in blessings of extraordinary kinds, with so much overflowing it jumps to others, turn into love, joy, and happiness for all my sisters and brothers. Ask anyone who I've encountered or passed by, they'll tell you they got hit by a very uplifting vibe. So if you're down, check and see if I'm close by, for I'm good at turning frowns into smiles, erasing tears from eyes. Oh. Yes! Yes! Excellent! So am I as the rich whose blessed key, whose life revolves around my own family. Although in this prison I dwell alone, at night my thoughts always carry me home. As in my lover's arms, I safely fall. 
Shakespeare was a writer who got his hands dirty. No area of life was free from his gaze. By the mid-1590s, he was writing three plays a year. They all had an earthy honesty which guaranteed hit after hit. Sex and violence sells. It was as true then as it is now. In his work, Shakespeare recognizes that we are a seething mass of passions about to break out, and he often explores these dark appetites that lurk at the bottom of the human soul. In Measure for Measure, a young nun called Isabella begs the audience for help as she tries to come to terms with the fact that Angelo, a seeming angel, has tried to attack her. She says, to whom should I complain? Did I tell this? Who would believe me? Oh, perilous mouths that bear in them one and the self-same tongue, either of condemnation or reproof, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws out to my brother. So sex and violence just beneath the surface. Civilization and barbarism are separated by a very, very thin line. In fact, language and civilization are a a thin veil covering our moral sweatiness. This is as true today as it was in Shakespeare's time. And in Shakespeare's time, it was a source of immediate and passionate concern. Nowhere was the thin line between civilization and barbarism clearer than in London. People lived on a knife edge, and death punctuated Shakespeare's plays. He talked of it in short, sharp words that anyone could understand. But to die, and go we know not where. But this filthy place was also the home of the glamorous Elizabethan court. The two sides of the city appeared to have little in common. But below the surface, the court was less refined. This was an age where treachery abounded and was punishable by death. Treachery pervades the plays again and again with short words, we hear the terror of Macbeth as he says to his wife, having just murdered his friend. I have done the deed. Is thou not here a noise? I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did not you speak? When? Ah. As I descend? Aye. Not only do the plays deal with political intrigue, they were also written in a world of political intrigue. All plays at this time had to be submitted to the royal censors before public performance. But Shakespeare's adaptation of well-known stories and his clever use of metaphor enabled him to slip past the censors while still producing plays that seemed dangerous and exciting. He was now so wealthy, he bought one of the biggest houses in Stratford for his family to live in. But while he was gaining a home in Stratford, he and his company were losing one in London. Their landlord had threatened to pull down their theater in Shoreditch. So one night in December, 1598, Shakespeare and his friends dismantled it and transported it timber by timber across the river to Bankside. The new theater became known as the Globe and its motto was totus mundus agit histrionum, a Latin proverb which was to become one of Shakespeare's most famous lines. All the world's a stage. I did not have sexual relations with that. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. Just after midday, the tanks rolled out of the square. A lone young man stood in front of the first one. The deployment is accelerating while the air war continues. An act of reconciliation between Britain and South Africa, despite the huge injuries of the past. He said, we come as friends. If we hear Shakespeare's language, we hear ourselves sometimes elevated and sometimes debased. He was very wary of political power and certainly avoided much reference to religion as in any way a source or influence. But we live in a time when gender and race and immigration and sexuality dominate our news screens. And in a way, it's fascinating to see that the themes that we are preoccupied with are the ones that he dealt with in his plays. In fact, 
he reads us as much as we read him. He has been translated into more than 80 different languages, from Arabic to Albanian to Yakut and Zulu. Unlike any other writer in the world, people from Poland to Korea have embraced Shakespeare, not as a great English poet, but as their own. You only have to look at the cinema to see how true this is. Shakespeare is the most filmed author ever. There are more than 300 versions of his plays on film, from Leonard Bernstein's version of Romeo and Juliet, West Side Story, to a teen flick version of The Tamey of the Shrew called Ten Things I Hate About You, to Kurosawa's samurai film of King Lear called Ran. When Eastern Europe was struggling under communist repression, the play they looked to time and time again was Hamlet, a 16th century play which famously spoke of something rotten in the state of Denmark. It still worked perfectly well as a metaphor for corrupt states in the 20th century. The gap between Shakespeare's life and his imaginative achievement is so great that it defies psychological explanation. However, that hasn't prevented certain biographers from seeing a connection between the death of his son, Hamlet, aged 11 in 1596, and the creation of his great iconic hero, Hamlet. to be that is the question whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing And them. Shakespeare probably returned to Stratford to bury Hamlet, but he can't have seen very much of this little boy during his short 11 years. Some say that he returned to Stratford every year during Lent when the theatres closed. Whatever the truth of it, he seems not to have had much time to be a family man. His devotion was to his work. In the morning they rehearsed, in the afternoon they performed, and at night he wrote, and probably not alone in a garret, but maybe in a pub like this one to take advantage of the free candlelight. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course into that part of heaven where night burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one. Yes. Bring me on. Hamlet is a play about a man asked by a ghost claiming to be his murdered father to take revenge for his murder by himself murdering his uncle, who's also his stepfather. Looks it not like the king. Mark it, Horatio. Most like. This is Shakespeare's longest play and immensely ambitious. Enormous in range, it distills a remarkable breadth of human experience into one character. If thou hast any sound or use of voice, Speak to me. Hamlet remains Shakespeare's most performed and quoted play. It may seem incredible that a 400-year-old story about a Danish prince can still be so relevant in our hard new world. But that's because Shakespeare does not write about the historical figure. He writes about the human being. And it's this that feels tremendously familiar. Hamlet is all of us. He's everyman. He's lost, shocked by the world of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. He is equipped to think, but he cannot quite act. He has a big heart. He's a sort of 
car crash between aspiration and self-hatred. And no character represents the 20th century and its anxiety so completely. Nice and quiet. And action. Well, look at the folks on you. Are you going to start a bicycle wheel with mud like that? Well, he's got domestic difficulties. The reason people are so fascinated by Hamlet is because human beings the world over are addicted to drama. And Hamlet is the ultimate domestic drama. So how do we want Roy to play this line then? Hamlet demonstrates a strange mix of weakness and power, hope and fear, jealousy and nobility that defines our lives. Through him, Shakespeare is allowing us to experience nothing less than the contradiction and tragedy of existence. He lets us see ourselves, even our worst selves. And action! Not too much beer. Of course it is. What's up with you? With a face like that, you're going to be lucky to sell a bicycle wheel. Yeah, he's got domestic difficulties, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. Look at Liam playing up, is he? No, it's not Liam, it's Sam. Well, what's she done? Well, she's got this thing going with Trevor. They're at it night and day. It's like living in a brothel. Jealousy, my son. It's a curse. I'm not jealous. Of course you're not. Look, the place is a pit. You know, I've got a kid in there. Well, then put her straight. It's the male's role to be dominant and to be assertive in his domestic environment. Isn't that right, Dad? Don't ask me, son. I wouldn't know. Oh, yeah. Hello, my darling. Thank you. I don't want to get a coffee. That's why the stories that are most necessary, the stories that make us feel ironically better about our own lives, are often the stories that investigate the messiness and suffering of other peoples. The only difference between comedy and tragedy is that in comedy, the characters surmount the events. In tragedy, the events surmount the characters. If there's any single reason why soap operas make such addictive viewing, it is because they function from this heady combination. And Shakespeare understood this long before. If it's intriguing that this man about whom we know so little could write so passionately about love, it's equally intriguing that he was also eager to depict darker feelings. I know. What? What do you know? About you and Kat in my house, in my bed, in my room. John, it isn't true. This invites us to think of him as a man who lived on the edge, who was torn apart by his emotions. But we just don't know. You know nothing about me if you can say something like that. No, he not. wrote nearly everything that needs to be said about the world, and yet gives very little away about himself. This, this is just... this is madness. None of this is true. I was always yours, always. No, no more lies, Desi, no more lies. <sighs> And so we don't know who this man is we have to thank for reminding us not just of love, but of our blind capacity for self-destruction. Get off me. Again? Again? Get off me. My life was just a game. No. It was a game no. to you, no. wasn't it? Great feats of engineering get us from A to B. Science helps us understand what's around us. But Shakespeare does what no one else has done. He makes us understand our thoughts and our feelings. And what could be more useful in our lives than that? On the 24th of March, 1603, Queen Elizabeth took her dying breaths. Her death signaled the end of the Tudors and the start of the Stuarts, as a Scot, James became king. Such was the importance of theatre in the life of the country at this time that within ten days of his arrival in London, King James had given his patronage to the Chamberlain's men. They were now renamed the King's Men, and Shakespeare and his colleagues became officers of the royal household. This patronage gave both prestige and a handsome source of income for the company. Now Shakespeare and his friend Ben Jonson, the stepson of a bricklayer, dominated the literary scene and were frequently found drinking together in London's Cheapside. Johnson immediately recognized Shakespeare's genius. He later wrote of his friend, he was not for an age, but for all time. But even Johnson could never have guessed how right he would be. Shakespeare had by now produced the greatest body of creative work the world had ever seen and ever would see. In the centuries to come, 
Thinkers from Descartes to Freud would pay homage to him as their source of inspiration. You might think the mystery of Shakespeare's life had finally ended. By the early 1600s, we know what he was doing, where he was doing it, and who was employing him. In fact, the greatest mystery of all was about to take place. For at some point between 1611 and 1613, this brilliant man, at the height of his powers, suddenly stopped, and he seems never to have written again. He left London, his home for 20 years, and went back to Stratford. He had written 38 plays. What could have driven someone so devoted to his craft to have abandoned it so dramatically? Perhaps it was the fire which destroyed his beloved globe in 1613, or perhaps he felt he had said it all. We'll never know. Certainly, the words of his last play, The Tempest, seem to read like a tired farewell. And my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. Just three years after his return to Stratford in 1616, he died on the same day he was born, the 23rd of April. Only three months earlier, he had claimed to be in good health, but it's thought that years of heavy drinking took its toll. After another drinking session with Ben Johnson at his younger daughter's wedding, he went down with a fever and never recovered. Not only, it seems, had he taken no care of himself, he had taken no care of his work. Only half his plays had been published in his lifetime, and it took his fellow actors to ensure the rest were finally set in print in 1623. This edition was known as the First Folio. He left behind no portrait, drawing, or sculpture of himself. And as others responded to the need to have some record of him, three images appeared which to this day we regard as his likeness. An engraving on the first folio, a bust on Shakespeare's grave, and an early portrait. It seems extraordinary and a little sad we don't know what the greatest creative mind in our history even looked like. By the 18th century, his admirers were finding this unbearably frustrating. He was now being described as a genius, and the Romantics wanted pictures that better suited their idea of a great man. And so, new images were created, and with them came the beginning of the transformation of Shakespeare from a playwright into a national icon. By the end of the 18th century, we were at war with France and obsessed with defending ourselves as an island nation. We needed an icon that would set us apart from the barbarian hordes across the water. The beauty and eloquence of Shakespeare's writing made him the perfect candidate. However, the problem about being a national icon meant that he got trapped sort of into a, a waxwork identity, when in fact his uniqueness and his greatness lies in his ability to write about us as we are now. He was able to take our strange foibles of free will and weave them into patterns that are amusing and terrifying. He held the mirror up to nature and, more importantly, he brings us hope. That's partly why we still need the 16th century man today. Not because of what he says about Britain, but for what he says about us. And perhaps we've never needed him so much. We live in an age where we're offered the possibility of a perfect world. We know in our hearts it's all an illusion. And that can leave us with a feeling of emptiness and discontent. What Shakespeare's storytelling does, like all good storytelling, be it comedy or tragedy, is to allow us to feel more compassionate about our own lives. Not by showing us the happiness of others, but by showing us their messiness and pain. It makes us understand 
that we're all in this together. Shakespeare isn't just the greatest Briton, or at least that's only a tiny part of what he is. He's also one of the greatest inspirations for anyone anywhere who wants or needs to look into the soul of humanity. That's why, if you want to understand Shakespeare's place in the world, you shouldn't necessarily go to Stratford. You should come here, to South Africa. When, in the 1960s, freedom fighters were imprisoned on a barren outcrop called Robben Island, it was Shakespeare they turned to for inspiration. This prison rock, off the coast of Cape Town, held Africans, Indians, Muslims, Christians, and atheists, but they all found common ground in Shakespeare. In 1959, the South African apartheid government turned a former naval base into a high security prison for black men. More than 3,000 political prisoners were sent to the island over the next 30 years. Sonny Van Katrathnam was brutally tortured before being imprisoned here for six years for his political beliefs. But the one thing that helped him through those years was the comfort he found in Shakespeare. He kept a copy of the complete works in his cell, disguised behind Indian religious pictures, and told the warders it was his Bible. During his time here, he circulated the book and asked fellow prisoners to autograph their favorite sections. The most popular were the defiant passages from plays such as Coriolanus, Henry V, and Julius Caesar. Stinney Moodley was imprisoned for six years and saw a close link between Shakespeare's plays and his own struggle against white supremacy. He chose an extract from Hamlet. What a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. Nelson Mandela served 18 of his 27 years in prison on Robben Island and described it as the harshest, most iron-fisted outpost of the South African penal system. On the 16th of December, 1977, he put his signature to Caesar's own fateful words. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I have yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death and necessary end will come when it will come. In 1991, the last political prisoners were freed from Robben Island. Through their years of isolation and suffering, it had been Shakespeare's plays that had reassured them they were not alone, that they were part of a universal drama. Breath makes us live, and thought makes us wise, and feeling makes us human, and all of these things converge in Shakespeare's plays. It's the ability for Shakespeare to be rediscovered and reinvented by each generation that makes his legacy so unique. No other writer in any language has been able to map our emotional DNA so accurately. He's taken old stories and retold them, old ideas and reinvented them, and always in a rhythm that is fundamental to who we are. He doesn't live then, he lives now. It doesn't matter that we can't find him. He finds us. His genius was in capturing ours. You can vote for your greatest Britain via BBC I, where you can also tell the world why you made your choice on the message board. Log on now to bbc.co.uk slash Great Britons and see the results as they come in.
coming up on BBC Two, the latest news on the votes rolling in from Peter Snow.